This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. A mother says to her little girl, did you say your prayers last night? The girl says, sort of. The mother says, what do you mean, sort of? Well, she says, I got down on my knees and started saying them. Then I thought, I bet God gets tired just hearing the same old prayers over and over. So I crawled into bed and told him the story of the three bears. What is prayer? How do you do it? What does it accomplish? What happens when you pray? Perhaps you would feel more qualified to expound on what doesn't happen when you don't pray. But to pray as if giving God a list of instructions would be akin to a college freshman coming into the university with the express intention of teaching his professors a thing or two, walking into paleontology or physics, intending to explain the subjects to the teacher. God, too, knows how things ought to be. Thus, the master taught to pray, your will be done. Is talking with God like trying to see a corporation president with 15 secretaries, three executive vice presidents, and a doorman you have to get past to have five minutes in his office? Again, taught the master, the kingdom of God is within you. And God has purposes for your life. Most people spend most of their time sitting around waiting for somebody else to do something. The only difference among religious people is that many of them spend their time sitting around waiting for God to do something. It occurs to very few that God may just be waiting for them to do something. Anybody who presumes that real religion is a philosophical feather bed for dozing and daydreaming simply has not learned what it is all about. Christ was a worker. His trade was carpentry. Paul was a tent maker. Peter, a fisherman. These were not men who spent all of their time just sitting around in the shade talking about God. They lived vitally and vibrantly among the world and its people. For them, religion was not a sleepy state of banal blissfulness, but a rugged, courageous challenge to live for the will of God, to live in love for God and love for people. And all of these, Jesus, Peter, and Paul, suffered death for the truth which they found and believed. If you think the life of Christ was easy, try living it. There was an experiment done by a child psychologist several years ago. He was watching a baby lying in its bassinet, waving its arms, kicking its feet, and the psychologist became interested in the question of how much exercise the baby was getting that way. So he put the baby on a blanket on the rug and lay down next to it himself. Then he personally began duplicating every motion, every action of arms, legs, and head that the baby did. Every time the baby twisted back and forth, the psychologist lying there on his back on the floor twisted back and forth as well. Whenever the baby flailed its feet in the air or raised its head to look at something, the psychologist did the same. And in 20 minutes, the psychologist reported himself exhausted. It looked easier until he tried it. Living a good life may likewise sound even dull. Just don't rob anybody, don't murder anybody, don't go to bed with anybody's wife, avoid parking tickets as best you can. But is that all there is to it? Is that all there is to living a good life? Just don't do anything bad. Is that the equivalent of a good life? Not according to one Jesus of Nazareth who said, that's just the beginning of it. Keeping the Ten Commandments is the very least of what Jesus taught. The Ten Commandments consist largely of a list of things not to do. Jesus said that is a good list, and this world would be a better place, far better, if everybody obeyed that list. But I have another list, an even more interesting list than that, consisting not just of things not to do, but of things to do. And the first two things on Jesus' list were to love God and love people. All the Ten Commandments demanded was that you not murder your next-door neighbor, and depending on who your next-door neighbor happened to be, with few exceptions, most people can manage that. But Jesus said, go beyond that. He said if it's a good thing just not to murder your next-door neighbor, wouldn't it be a far better thing in addition to that, in addition to permitting that person to live, to love that individual? Jesus' teachings are not merely that mankind cease evil, but that mankind do good. He even said to do good to those who do evil to you. Someone may object at this point, but what about justice? If someone does evil to me and all I do is good back to him in return, where is the justice of that? Consider this question. Is justice a good thing? Yes, 
you would answer justice is good, than if someone does evil to you, and you act justly in return toward him, you would have done good to him, would you not? Since justice is good. But Jesus taught that the attitude of God toward human beings is merciful justice, or what might best be depicted as fairness. God is fair. God loves you infinitely as a son or daughter. But Jesus not only taught to do good, he also taught the secret of the power to do good. He told people how to tap the ultimate energy of this universe, spiritual energy for the living of life, the very infinite God of all this seemingly boundless cosmos loves you, has given a spark of his spirit to indwell you, and if you will turn to God with all your heart, put your trust and faith in God, you will begin to live as you were born and created to live, as it feels right to live, with a new zest, joy, spiritual enthusiasm for life, and a new love for God and people. And that, one day, will change this world. But it can change your life beginning here and now, if you will have it so. To live in this fashion is a delight, but some will say they can't believe God could love them that much. doesn't make that much sense. This may be your primary barrier to faith. But it doesn't make sense to you that the very God of all this universe, who it would seem must have quite enough to do, merely keeping the suns, moons, and stars from colliding into each other, that this boundless being could actually know about you and know you personally, care about your life. You may say, I can't fathom that intellectually. But then does love ever make that much sense? If you say the idea that the creator of all reality loves you simply doesn't make that much sense to your mind, I ask in response whether real love ever makes that much sense to the human mind. Strictly from a mental or intellectual standpoint, why should a mother and father love their children? Why should they care about their sons and daughters with such affection that they will nurse those children through a helpless infancy, clothe them, educate them, want for their children all of the best their money can buy in medical attention, health, schooling, environment, surroundings, cultural sensitization, all the other fruits of civilization? What makes sense? about that, really, strictly from an intellectual standpoint. Why should the parents lavish all that love and attention on children? What's in it for the parents in doing all that, really? The very same money the parents could be using to take a trip around the world or buy another car or a bigger house they will spend to send their children to the best universities and usually not ask for it back. The time and energy those parents will spend in rearing those children, they could have been spending on their own entertainment at the theater, golf courses and nightclubs, flying to Las Vegas or whatever. From the strictly intellectual point of view, love never does make that much sense. Intellectually speaking, all that would be necessary for the survival of the human race would be the sheer act of reproduction. Someone could argue that is all any parent owes his child. Just the fact of bringing that child into existence, that's enough. But love is never content with that. The love of a good father or a good mother not only wants existence for that child, it furthermore wants good for that child. Such is the nature of love. It's the longing to bring good into the life and experience of another. It may not make much intellectual sense, but that is the way it is, and love remains the highest of human expressions. And so it is with God, like an earthly parent. God was not content merely to bring you into being, to create you, and then forget about you, then be done with you. God maintains a vital interest, a passionate interest in your life, in what you're doing, what you are becoming. The Eternal Father has a love for you so unbelievably boundless that once you recognize it, once you dare to believe it, once you dare to accept it, once you dare to let God love you fully, your life and your perspective can never again be the same. God loves you boundlessly right here, right now, this very moment. God knows your name, how old you are, where you were born, where you live, where you work, what you're afraid of. 
what you hope for, who you love, and who you don't, every good, bad, and indifferent thing you've ever done in all your life. God knows your IQ, your education, your problems, your possibilities, what you're wearing, which side you part your hair on, how many hairs there are in your head in the first place, every freckle on the back of your neck. And why does God know and care about you and love you that much? Why? Because you're so smart or so handsome or pretty or clever or holy? No, because you are his child, his son or daughter. That is why, and that is enough. That is all the reason God has ever needed to love anybody, because that person is his child, and that's all the reason God needs to love you. And if you can believe that, if you can believe this is a friendly universe, that you are infinitely valuable and every other person on this planet is likewise inestimably valuable, black or white or red or yellow or any other hue or shade between brothers and sisters in one spiritual family of God. That can change your life and that can change the world. And even though you may not understand that love, you can know it, you can feel it, you can experience it. Beginning when? When you die? Beginning ten years from now, after you've prayed, meditated, and worshipped three hours a day between now and then? No, beginning here and now, if you will choose it. You can begin to live in a newfound peace and joy the moment you dare by faith. Just to accept this living, transformative love the infinite creator of this universe has for you personally, that moment can be here and now. Then life becomes an adventure. One vital insight into the art of living is the recognition that problems ought to be fun. A chess or checkers game, for instance, is nothing more nor less than a series of problems to be solved. The same holds true of a crossword puzzle, a game of hide-and-seek, hopscotch, jacks, even solitaire. But think about it. If for diversion, if for relaxation, for fun, you spent your childhood solving the problems inherent in a game of hide-and-seek or baseball or basketball, football or soccer, sometimes even at the risk of injury, why then... Should you as an adult be fearful or trembling or upset at problems in business or marriage or college, club work or whatever, if you can enjoy solving the problems involved in playing a game of bridge or checkers, then why not approach the very problems of your daily life with the same sort of zest? See the possibilities in your problems. See life as an exciting challenge. Begin thus to live fearlessly as the son or daughter of the living God you really are. God not only has a plan for this planet, but a will, a purpose for your human life. Said the master, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. Ask and you will receive. If you're interested in these topics, write to us. We want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviated SRI. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address, SRI, Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Seven Principles of Prayer, Life After Death, What Does Happen When You Die? If you're interested in these topics, no cost, no charge, no obligation, nobody's going to come to your door with an attache case and try to sell you something. Simply write to the Spiritual Renaissance Institute Box, 3080 Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.